Hey everyone, welcome back. So in this video, we shall see how to calculate the uh, or how to estimate the mean uh, of a stationary time series from uh, an observed data set. So the theoretical or the autocorrelation and the cross-correlation formulae that we derived so far are useful in describing properties of uh, certain models. Um, however, for most analyses, we need to uh, perform them using an actual data set. So basically in a data set or in a time series data set, we can, we'll have uh, some n time points or uh, we'll sample say the time series x at n time points t1 through tn and we have to somehow use these for estimating the mean or the autocovariance and the autocorrelation functions. In a typical or in a classical statistics, right, when we want to uh, estimate a mean of a random variable, we'll go out there, collect a data set, uh, collect a sample size of n, our data will be typically identically and independently distributed. And then to estimate the mean of that variable, we will calculate the mean of the data set, right? So the average of the data is the estimate of the population mean. That is what we usually do. So if you want to calculate or estimate the mean of uh, uh, the height of all the students at Wake Forest, then I can go and collect a sample of say size 100 uh, and then estimate this mean of uh, the student, uh, the mean height of the entire student population uh, by using uh, the average of the uh, average value of the data set that I have collected, right? Um, in time series, however, uh, this will not work in, in, a, in a usual time series uh, or in a general time series model because if the uh, series is changing with time, then we cannot just average points over the time points, right? Because that wouldn't work. Um, so we make certain uh, assumptions. Um, so basically a time series, we can think of these n time points Right? We can think of this as a single sample on n-dimensional uh, uh, multivariate data set. Right? So in this classical statistics, I would have n samples on one dimension variable in the height example or, or that I took. In time series, um, it's like it's, it's one sample size on n-dimensional data set. Um, so you can see uh, why it is difficult or challenging to find or to estimate something, right? We need certain sample size uh, and we don't have that in the time series. We have uh, sample size is one in time series, even though we have n observations, right? So to get around this, uh, we use this assumption of stationarity. Without stationarity, uh, there is very little we can do, but with stationarity, at least something as basic as mean of the data can be easily computed. So in a time series, so one of the assumptions of a stationary time series is that mean remains constant through time. So because mean does not change in time, so mean at this point through this point is the same, then then I can use these this data set. I can then I can look at the average of these data points to get an estimate for my uh, population level mean. So we can use averages over the single realization or the single sample point, right? So we have this single sample point of n-dimensional data. We can average over all of the points uh, to estimate the mean and the covariance function if our series is stationary. So say y is a stationary series. That means its mean doesn't depend on time, which means it is a constant. So we can just denote it by some constant mu. And if we have the series at n points, so we have this data set. So remember, this is y at time, the first time point and y at, y at the nth time point. And we take its average, right? So we, so I'm saying that I'm going to estimate this mu using y bar or y bar is the estimate of mu. Is it a good estimate of mu, right? So I can propose anything, right, any estimate of mu, but it is pointless unless it is a good enough estimate. So what is a good enough estimate? When will y bar be a good estimate? So we'll study a couple of properties of 
uh, this average y bar. So the first property is that it is an unbiased estimator of mu. What is unbiased estimator? Expectation of y bar is equal to mu. If this is if this is true, then it is an unbiased estimator. So y bar is an estimator of mu. If its expectation is equal to mu, then it is an unbiased estimate. So let's see if we can, uh, uh, if this holds true. Expectation of y bar, plug in the formula. Expectation goes inside. Expectation of yi is mu because y is stationary. And this is equal to mu. So yes, it is unbiased, okay? So another property that we'll study relates to the stability of this weight estimate. So your estimates are good, right? If you have an unstable estimate, then you, won't, you wouldn't think of it to be very good, right? So what do I mean by, a, by stability or instability? So I'm talking about the variance. If the variance of y bar is large, then it is relatively unstable, which is not a good thing. If it's small, then it's stable and it's a good thing. So next we'll study the variance of y bar. Variance of y bar has this formula. It's a little, it looks a little bit messy and confusing, but we'll uh, sort this out. But notice one thing, there is an n ahead of it, right? So as n increases, this variance will decrease. So it will be more stable, which is a good thing. So the larger the sample size or the larger the number of data points, uh, sample size is not the right thing to say here. Uh, so larger the number of data points, uh, the more reliable is the uh, estimate of the mean or the more reliable is y bar. Um, so this kind, uh, so you also, this holds true for all of the other estimates you've seen so far. Uh, in other courses, you know that the larger the sample size, the better it is. And this is one of the reasons why larger uh, data points or more data points is better. Okay. So variance of, so let's see if we can prove this. Okay. So variance of y bar, just plug in the formula. Uh, you know that if, if you pull out this constant, it becomes 1 by n squared, and this is what we will evaluate. To make this a little bit easy to understand, uh, we'll uh, take this case of n is equal to 5. So we're looking at 5 data points. Of course, uh, the arguments that we will make using these 5 data points will hold more generally as well. So variance of y bar, so I'm saying n is equal to 5 right now. Uh, so this is a sum of all the y's, sum of all the y's. So remember, you have to open this up, open this up. And you have to be careful when you open this up. So I always like to follow a pattern. So I'll, I'll, I'll pick y1 here and go through the entire list on the right hand side. That is y1, y2, y1, y3 through y1, y5. Then I'll pick y2 and then go through all of the variables. And finally, I will have y5 and y5. That will be the last pair. So you have to make sure you take all the pairs. There is no need to write down all of them, but you should be aware of how to write them down. Um, so just for practice and for clarity, I'm going to list out the pairs. So there's covariance of y1 and y1, y2. So we keep y1 fixed or the first uh, variable fixed and we'll vary the second one. So 3, 4 and 5. Now we'll change the first one to y2 and then vary the others. And if we uh, go through all of the variables, this is the entire list of all the pairs, okay? There's five rows and five columns, this total 25 points. Okay, so now we know all of the pairs here. Remember, this is a stationary series, so we are going to introduce lags into this covariance. So we are going to replace all of these pairwise covariances by their lags. So lag I'm defining as this. So y, if my first time point is t and the second is s, my lag h is t minus s. So this lag is 0. 1 minus 2 is minus 1. So lag is minus 1, minus 2, 3, and minus 4. So similarly, 2 minus 1 is 1. And you go through the entire list. And these are all of the lags. Uh, so we are going to be replacing all of these terms, right? This uh, these terms in the yellow in the formula for the variance of y bar. So remember, we are taking sums over all of these terms, right? So all of we are summing over all of this. But you can see that there are a lot of repeating terms, right? 
So uh, gamma, so this term uh, covariance with lag zero occurs one, two, three, four, five times. So instead of just writing the sum, uh, instead of saying this plus this plus this plus this plus this, I can just say five times gamma y naught, right? That That's a shorter way to write it. So we are going to count how many times these terms repeat. So I have all of these terms here. So gamma y naught repeats five times or n times. Remember n was five. Gamma y minus one repeats n minus one times, which is four. So gamma minus two repeats three times. So minus two is one, two, three. Two is one, two, three. Also repeats the same number of times. So minus two or plus two, they repeat the same number of times. Same goes for minus three and plus three. And finally, minus four and plus four, there's exactly one four and one minus four. So uh, now we are ready to go back and replace the uh, all the sums of covariances with these new terms. So remember, uh, so gamma 4 occurred exactly once, right? And that was n minus 1. So I have now written this in a more general fashion, okay? So now we'll take n inside. So I have this 1 by n square. I, uh, we'll take it inside. We get this. And note that n minus 1 by n can be written in this fashion as 1 minus 1 by n. Similarly, n minus 2 by n has this form and so on. Uh, finally, 1 by n can be written. So where does 1 by n come? 1 by n would be here, right? If we take n inside, this would be 1 by m. Then we have 1 by n here. So 1 by, 1 by n can be written as 1 minus n minus 1 by n. So this is just rewriting things, a, a little bit of mathematical manipulations. But basically, when you replace it, you get this, okay? And now you can see that this looks closer to what we wanted to prove to begin with. But again, we don't want the sum. It's too much writing. So you're going to substitute this with a summation sign. So I have summation n goes. So remember the lowest value we saw was minus 4. And the highest value we saw was 4, right? So uh, the highest value so is n minus 1. And the lowest value was minus of n minus 1. And uh, so that's gamma i. Remember, it was gamma y minus 4 was the minimum 1. So the i goes here. And so now in this term, so for minus, if even though we have minus 1 here, it's plus 1 here. It's plus 1, plus 1. Minus 2, it's a plus 2. So basically, this is the absolute value of i. So these two numbers match in their magnitudes. So this is absolute value of i. And if I were to plug in i is equal to n, right? If I, if I was equal to n, this would be n minus n by n, which is 0. Okay. So plugging in i is equal to n is like adding another 0. So it doesn't change anything. So that gives you this term. So I have added in two terms. In each time, I have i is equal to 1. So basically, I'm adding two zeros. So nothing changes. So why do we write it this way? Because this is easier to remember. So we have an n here. Summation goes from minus n to m. n in the denominator is just much cleaner. Okay. So, uh, so finally, we have derived the formula for the variance. So just to see how this works out. So remember this variance of y bar, I have a data set, right? Y bar, uh, variance of y bar involves this covariance of a covariance structure of my time series, okay? Um, so I still do not know how to actually calculate the variance. I need to first uh, get this covariance. So for example, if y is a white noise, then if you recall the autocovariance structure of the white noise, then you will know that it is sigma square for i is equal to 0 and 0 everywhere else. So this is the only surviving term. We don't actually have the final number because we don't know what a sigma square, right? So variance of y bar, we do not know what it is still. That needs to be estimated. So basically, to calculate the variance of y bar for any time series model or any time series process, 
we need to know the autocovariance function, right? We need to know the autocovariance function for this white noise. And therefore, we need to estimate it from the data set. So next, we focus on estimating the autocovariance function. To get the complete answer, I need the sigma hat. So I need to estimate the autocovariance function from the data set. So that is what we shall see in the next video. That is all for this one. Uh, see ya.